Asheville. We are interrupting our regular music programming to bring you a uh, candidate form for districts 114, 115, and 116. And Dr. Chris Cooper is the moderator, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Cooper right now. Great. Well, thanks so much for having us. Thanks so much for listening in and paying attention. Today, we're talking to candidates for, uh, for North Carolina's House of Representatives. The people elected here will elect Buncombe County and the General Assembly in Raleigh. I just want to say at the outset, it, it's confusing to some folks. This is not Congress. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's a lot more important. As more and more power devolves to the states, these are the folks who are going to make decisions that affect your lives. Abortion, debates over voting rights versus voting integrity, health care. The action is not happening in Washington on those issues. It's happening in Raleigh. So kudos to all four of these folks for being here today, for running for office, and to putting their time, their money, and their energy where their mouth is. So, so thanks. We need people like this to make democracy work. Um, the districts, just to let you know, if you live in Buncombe County, you live in one of three state house districts, 114, 115, or 116. I encourage you to look at a map and look it up. We'll talk about that. But just in general terms, run 14 runs sort of roughly on the east side of Buncombe County. It's currently represented by John Ager. We got two folks running, Democrat Eric Ager, who's here today, and Republican Everett D. Patillo. District 115, situated sort of in the southwest corner of Buncombe County, is currently represented by Democrat Brian Turner. Today, Democrat Lindsey Prather is here, and Republican Pratik Bhakta is also running for office there. District 116, sort of in general terms on the northwest side of Buncombe County, uh, the district is currently represented by Caleb Rudow, who took over when Susan Fisher retired. We have uh, both candidates for this office here today, the aforementioned Caleb Rudow, and then Republican Molly Rose. If you're not sure which district you live in, I don't blame you, it's confusing, it changes all the time. Luckily, our local Buncombe County Board of Elections has a great user-friendly website that'll let you figure out which district you're in. If you'd rather go to the State Board of Elections website, no problem, you can also find the answer there. Just type in your address, you'll get a sample ballot, it's gonna show this, it's also gonna show all of the other offices you can vote for. So with that out of the way, we're going to move on to the main course. Um, just to let you know how this is going to go, we're going to start off with three-minute introductions. I'll kind of call people as I see them on my Zoom screen in order. Uh, and then I'll begin to ask some questions. We're going to shoot for about two minutes per answer. If there's any rebuttal necessary, we'll try to limit those to one minute. Um, so with all that said, uh, I guess, uh, Eric Ager, if you'd like to begin and with your three-minute opening statement. Sure, thanks, thanks, Chris, and, and thanks everybody for being here, and thanks everybody for listening. Um, I'm Eric Ager, I'm running for uh, North Carolina House District 114, which I tell people is kind of Fairview, Black Mountain, Swannanoa, Barnardsville, East Asheville, and downtown to the river. Um, so it is a little bit different than it used to be, um, but, it's, uh, but it's a great place. I, I grew up in, in Fairview, uh, you know, at, on Hickernut Gap Farm, went to Reynolds High School, uh, had a great public education here in Buncombe County. I went on to graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis and was commissioned as an ensign in the Navy um, at 22. Um, I spent 25 years in the Navy. During that time, I, uh, I got married to my incredible wife, Rachel, and we had four kids uh, who we raised sort of around the country and around the world. Um, and had a great Navy career. I was a helicopter pilot for about the first 15 years of my career, and then spent some time in the international field um, doing international relations and flying a little bit there as well. Um, you know, the real reason that I've come back to run for North Carolina House is that as I was, uh, you know, working on democracy and, and, and security policy around the world, I, I, I realized that, you know, we had some struggles back at home and, and really wanted to come back and be you know, to help, to help, help uh, work on our democracy back at home. We're, we're awfully, uh, you know, divided and, and that's a real problem for a democracy. We've got to figure out how to, how to make, make decisions and move ahead. And, uh, and so I hope to be part of that, part of that uh, process. Um, you know, I, of course, I believe that, uh, that healthcare decisions should be between a patient and their doctor. 
um, you know, and, and not mandated or, or moderated by the government. Um, I think our public schools are a real challenge and that we've got to, you know, get out there. And, uh, you know, I, I went to some great public schools and, and 20, 25 years ago, our public schools here in, in North Carolina were some of the best and, and they're just not anymore. And, uh, and that's, that's something that, that the General Assembly can, can really help with um, as, as we move forward. The three big issues that I talk about that I think we really need to, to make a difference on immediately here are mental health care, both for veterans and, and for everyone. I had a cousin who committed suicide last summer and, uh, and it had a real impact on our family. Um, the second thing that I think is really critical is, uh, is bringing farmers and environmentalists together. These are the people that care the most about the soil and water um, and air in our community. And we need to bring those folks together to, do, to make some common sense decisions. I feel like I'm a good person to do that. And finally, we need uh, high-speed internet for, for everyone in North Carolina. Uh, there's still places in Buncombe County where it's a challenge. So thank you all very much. And uh, I look forward to talking with the rest of you. Great. And we'll hear next from Caleb Rudell from uh, uh, District 116. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cooper, for organizing. And I'm really happy to be here with the other candidates. Uh, my name is Caleb Rudell. I'm proud to be the representative uh, for District uh, 114, running in 116. I represent North Asheville, Weaverville, Woodfin, parts of West Asheville, Sandy Mush, and Lester. So if you live in one of those places, I work for you. Um, and it's an honor to serve you uh, in the General Assembly. I grew up in Asheville, the proud product of Asheville Public Schools. Um, and I, I grew up here, but felt called to a life of service and work around the world. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Zambia uh, for three and a half years after graduating from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and I've served and worked in Costa Rica, uh, Honduras, Spain. And I went to grad school at LBJ School of Public Affairs in Texas and probably would have continued working abroad until Trump got elected. And I had a choice to continue my international work or, or pivot to the United States. And I felt like our country is better than the meanness and the nastiness and the bad policy coming from Trump. And so I became an organizer and I've been splitting my time since then as an organizer for the Democratic Party um, and as a data scientist um, uh, working in international development data and data for decision making. And I'm thrilled to be appointed to this position uh, and serving since February because it brings together my passion for service, my organizing background and my policy background. And since February, uh, I've you know, really taken seriously this idea of you know, working for the people and I've been really busy. Uh, we've been knocking on doors uh, around the district. I'm proud to say we've knocked on you know, over 700 doors uh, in every trailer park, uh, every public housing location we've stopped by. And I've been knocking on doors, not to ask people's vote, but to say, hey, I'm your representative. My name's Caleb Rudow. I work for you. You know, what can I do to help? Um, and I've been knocking on doors to, to help folks. And we have been connecting folks to programs like the Affordable Connectivity Program, which is the $30 subsidy for broadband. We've been connecting folks to the NC Cash Program, which is the Unclaimed Property Office, and have you know, gotten over $30,000 to people in the district. Um, and, and that's really the heart of, of what I believe politics and service is about, is helping folks, however we can do that. Some of that's policy, and some of that is knocking on doors and making sure people know what government programs they benefit from and making sure they sign up. But a big part of what we've also done is, is knocking on doors is listening to folks. Um, and you know when you hear from people in the district, you tend to hear the same stories, which is I'm having a hard time paying rent, I'm having a hard time paying my medical bills. Uh, you hear the same thing, which is I need more help. And, and that's why I'm running in November, because I believe we can do better by the people in my district. Uh, I'm excited to continue working for them um, if elected in November. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Molly Rose next. Well, hi, thank you so much for doing this. Um, you know, listening to the other candidates, it really makes me reflect how any of us that are volunteering to serve in this office are coming from a place of really caring about the community and our neighbors. And we just have different ideas about what really will help and what will solve uh, the problems that our community is facing. Um, I, I volunteered to, to run um, because I uh, really got more engaged in, in the political uh, scene as a result of the pandemic and seeing uh, what I felt was government overreach, mandates, shutdowns, 
and things and, and even suppression of debate about the effectiveness of these different health strategies. So um, I believe in our constitution. I believe in our government system. And it was set up, I believe, to make sure that government didn't get too big and too powerful. And uh, because when government does that, it can, uh, it can really get away from what people really want from being representative. So I believe in our system and I believe that um, we need to take care right now that we are respecting uh, the foundation of our country, the constitution that's made our country so great and made our country the place so many people want to come to. Um, so that that's my basis. That was my big impetus that got me started. And uh, I'm not an expert on a lot of things. I have 30 years, over 30 years experience working uh, with children and families as a counselor, as an advocate, a mental health professional. And uh, what they taught me was how to listen and how to respect the people that I'm there to help. And, uh, you know, I learned to really respect people and what people can do when they are self-directed and they're given the supports that they need to do that. So I, I believe that fiscally responsive, responsible policies uh, where we take care of public funds is important. I believe we have to support free enterprise because it's people that are taking the initiative and being entrepreneurs that stimulate prosperity for everybody. Um, I believe education is primary. The children are our future. Uh, education's taken a hit because of the pandemic and it needs to be prioritized. Uh, but I also believe in school choice. I think that by having school choice, quality of education will improve and that's especially true for the disadvantaged uh, because well-off people already have school choice. Um, and of course, mental health, that's been my whole background. Uh, mental health is the source of a lot of the problems that we face today. So um, I believe in law and order. I think that uh, crime has become a problem in Buncombe County that it never was. I moved here, um, a little over 26 years ago and fell in love with the mountains, the people, and it felt like such a safe, friendly place to be. And I fear that some of that is changing and uh, we need to really look at what are the problems with crime and what sparked this and what do we need to do about it. And we have All right, well, great. Um, thank you, I will go to Lindsay Prather next. Sure, thank you and thank you for having us. I'm Lindsay Prather, and I am running for North Carolina House District 115, which is Western and Southern Buncombe County. Uh, I grew up in North Carolina, and like Eric, uh, I remember when we were the flagship of the South uh, for public education, um, when we were could be proud to be uh, North Carolinians, when we led, led our region in, in public education, taking care of the environment and, and our economy. Um, and that is, that's why I'm running for office, because I want every child and every student in North Carolina to have that same amazing public education experience that I had. Uh, I graduated from University of North Carolina Asheville as a North Carolina Teaching Fellow Scholar. I got my degree in sociology and my high school social studies teaching license, and I taught in Buncombe County Schools for six years. I taught special education, American history, and civics. Uh, and my experiences there really really are what led me to want to run. Um, teaching civics in particular, you know, I finally realized that no matter how engaging or compassionate or creative of a teacher I was, uh, if my students didn't have breakfast that morning or if they didn't know where they were gonna sleep that night, uh, they didn't care what the five principles of the US Constitution were or what years the American Civil War happened. Um, and so really wanting to kind of take a step back, look at the bigger picture, and, and have that larger impact on, on my students' lives. Uh, leaving the classroom was very hard, but uh, I'm still able to advocate and work for public education outside of that classroom. I uh, ended up going to grad school, got my master's in public affairs from Western Carolina, 
Uh, so my husband and I, between the two of us, have degrees from the three best schools in North Carolina, UNCA, Western, and uh, AB Tech Community College. Um, since I ended up getting my master's, I've been working at UNC Asheville, counseling incoming transfer students, working with adult learners uh, at our local community colleges, helping people to, to come back and, and finish their degree. Um, I, uh, I care a lot about representation, and I think we have a representation problem in North Carolina. Uh, when I get elected to the House, I will single-handedly be bringing down the average age uh, of legislators in Raleigh. I'll also be bringing down the average income of legislators in Raleigh. Uh, I think there are a lot of things we need to talk about, about our structure of government and how accessible it is to different types of people who need to run for office. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to, to representing voices in North Carolina that haven't historically and traditionally been represented. Um, so I uh, am a first time candidate, um, but I have been working in the county for a long time in public service. I've done a lot of work with our local party, in particular focused on voter registration, voter education, and uh, bringing more young people into the process. And I look forward to continue to doing those things from Raleigh. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I think I learned a lot. Of, I know other folks did too. We'll just uh, kind of move around the order. So we'll start with uh, Caleb Rudow on this question, then to Molly Rose, then to Lindsey Prather, uh, then to Eric Eager on this one. So we'll start with, with Caleb. Um, we'll go on to, I don't know, what are the biggest issues in North Carolina politics, which of course is Medicaid expansion. 38 states and the District of Columbia have expanded Medicaid. North Carolina has not. There was some movement last session as uh, the majority leader of the Senate, Bill Berger, got behind expansion. A lot of the Senate came with him, but yet here we sit today without Medicaid expansion in North Carolina. Where do you exp uh, where do you stand on Medicaid expansion um, in North Carolina moving forward? Thanks for the question. You know, I I, I fir stand firmly uh, for expanding Medicaid. I, I think. It's, it's a no brainer in terms of our economics. We're losing out on money and taxes that we're paying in the system that we're not getting back with funding. It's a no brainer for helping people who have a hard time paying their medical bills. And, and, and I think, you know, there's this conversation sometimes in, in politics where we can't afford to do it, you know, or to expand Medicaid, but we can't afford not to because we're losing out on, on, on money from federal funding. We can't afford not to because you know, people are we're already paying for it. And, and when we, hospitals are paying for it, but they're just not getting reimbursed. That's bad for rural hospitals. That's bad for our healthcare system. And we can't afford not to because people are, are dying because they don't have access to healthcare and, and they won't show up to the doctor's office. So I was, in really, I was encouraged that the, the state Senate um, uh, put this forward and, and voted to expand uh, Medicaid. And I'm just hoping the House will, will step up and do the right thing. And, and I've been really working hard to try to talk to my colleagues across the aisle to try to make the case that I just made to y'all, which is that, you know, we really benefit from expanded access to health care. It's what I hear from my constituents all over the campaign trail. Uh, I think it's the right thing to do to help people, and it's the right thing to do economically and stand in strong support of it. Thank you. Thank you. Holly Rose? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Um, I want to look at that more before I decide definitely. Um, I think Medicaid has a lot of problems with waste, with over-regulating, making, um, making doctor's offices uh, go through so many hoops and fill out so much paperwork. Uh, they hardly have time for patients. There's a lack of providers that accept Medicaid. And uh, when we expand Medicaid, there's going to be a huge increase in the number of people uh, looking for providers who will actually take Medicaid as the insurance. Um, so I think there's problems that we need to address with Medicaid and not just expand it. I'd like to see it available to more people who need it, though. Uh, also, there's the certificate of need. You probably have all maybe read about that, but um, we have to address costs. We have to lower costs. And the certificate of need, looking at that as part of that, uh, but that's got to be part of the picture, too. Okay. Thank you. Lindsay Prather? Yeah, I uh, am absolutely in favor of expanding Medicaid. Uh, I think we need to do it yesterday. Uh, and I, you know, while I was also uh, heartened and, and hopeful to hear that 
there might be some movement on the other side. Uh, I, I want to know why it's taken so long. Um, and I want to know why it's coming up now right before the election. Uh, it is absolutely something that should be bipartisan. Uh, and, and just like Representative Rudow said, I mean, if, if, if you don't want to go with the moral argument, which I absolutely support, then let's go with the economic argument. Uh, we are leaving money on the table. Our money is going to healthcare systems in other states. Uh, and, um, and it is expensive to have a large number of people who are uninsured in North Carolina. Um, so yes, we need to do it and we need to do it fast. Thank you. Eric Ager. Thanks, Chris. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, we should have expanded Medicaid a long time ago. It, it's a, a simple uh, solution that helps real people solve real problems. Maybe it's not perfect, but it, it's certainly a better solution than nothing, which is what we're giving people at this point. Um, and yeah, and it's really an example of people putting politics before people. And uh, and, and I think our legislators have done that for, for too long. Um, I mean, look, not expanding Medicare was a factor in in the privatization of our clinic here in Asheville, or our hospital here in Asheville Memorial. Um, and maybe it wasn't the only reason, but but certainly was was part of the reason that that we that that clinic for that hospital sold out to HCA, which has really been a disaster for the people of, of this region. So, um, yeah, I mean, we need to expand it and we need to expand it quickly. Great. Thank you very much. We'll begin uh, the next question with Molly Rose. Um, so, look, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask at least one question about abortion here today. The Dobbs decision gave states tremendous power in determining the reach and the limits of abortion rights in states. If you were elected, where will you stand on abortion rights in North Carolina in the General Assembly? Well, I'll stand uh, with uh, the people that I represent. Um, I agree with the, the Dobbs decision because I think the decision needs to be brought, brought back, back to the people and not made by a, a handful of elected um, judges or appointed judges, pardon me. So I stand with, I, I think that we need a robust public debate about it and it needs to be put in the hands of the people of North Carolina. I'm in favor of that. Great. Lindsay Prather? We, um, we need to codify Roe in this country. Uh, I said in the beginning that I care about representation and the vast majority of people in North Carolina and in this country support abortion access. Um, I don't think that there is a role for politicians in this. Um, I agree that the decision should be with the people. Uh, I think that it should be legal and I think that individuals should have the right to make that decision for themselves. Um, you know, Republicans in, in North Carolina have already told us uh, that they're going to take it back up in January. Um, so we are absolutely going to see this. Uh, North Carolina is anticipating a massive increase in the number of abortions that we're going to perform because we are now basically the last holdout in the South. Uh, we are serving the entire region when it comes to, to reproductive health care. Uh, and we really, really need to hold that line and to continue serving the people that need us, um, especially the people right here in North Carolina that, that do support abortion access, just like I do. Thank you. Eric Ager? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, I mean, I think healthcare decisions should be between uh, a patient and their doctor and their clergy, and, and, and all these discussions are very important. There's a lot of nuance in, this, in, the, in these individual decisions, and we don't need government to be, uh, you know, uh, making the decisions that, that regular people ought to be making. So that's really where I stand, um, and I think we need to, to move forward with, with, uh, with codifying Roe. Caleb Yeah, I, I agree with, with my colleagues on this. You know, I think the first step here is codifying Roe. Um, I, I believe that, you know, politicians, as the, there's a button I have that says politicians make crappy doctors. And I think that's, I think that's the truth. I, I think, you know, this, as my colleague said, um, is a personal decision. Uh, it's a spiritual decision. And, you know, it, it's a decision about family planning. And, and the majority of people who have abortions have already have kids. And, and, I, and I think we, we need to keep that in mind that, you know, this is about health care. This is about people making plans for their future. Um, and I stand in strong support of, of, of people's right to make their own decisions. Great. Thank you so much. We'll start this next question with Lindsey Brather. Um, there's, a, there's a tension in American politics, and I think in North Carolina politics as well, 
around the issues of voting rights and voter security. Are elections in North Carolina accessible enough? Are they secure enough? And what should the General Assembly's role be in providing for better elections in North Carolina? So are elections in North Carolina accessible enough? Are they secure enough? And what should the General Assembly's role in particular be in providing for better elections in North Carolina? Great question. Um, so as a civics nerd, uh, this is this is incredibly important to me. <laughs> um, I do feel that the elections in North Carolina are secure enough. Um, I feel that they could be more accessible. Uh, I think that I think we do a pretty decent job in North Carolina. We have fantastic boards of elections. We have a great state board of elections here in North Carolina. We've got a great website where people can look up all the information they need. You know, not all states have that. Um, and so those are things that are, I think, really important. There is an issue in North Carolina with, with trust in the election process. And I believe that has a lot more to do with um, what people are being told and the messages that they're being given as opposed to the actual process itself. Uh, I believe that we should make it as easy as possible for people who are eligible to vote to vote. Uh, I was thrilled to see us um, provide more uh, access to the ballot when it comes to convicted felons in North Carolina. Um, I highly support our pre-registration process for 16 and 17 year olds. Um, I think there are, you know, there's, there's research and data out there that we can be using when it comes to things like how long early voting days should be or how many days of early voting we should have before the election, right? Those things are, are a little bit debatable and we can take a look at those uh, in terms of what works and, and what people use. Um, and so I uh, am, am absolutely in favor of expanding that access and, uh, and, and supporting our election integrity in North Carolina. Great, thank you so much. Eric Ager. Thanks, thanks Lindsay for a great answer. Um, yeah, I mean, giving people, as many people as possible, the opportunity to vote is critical in a democracy and we, we need all of our citizens to vote and we need to make that possible for everybody um you know fraud is 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 just something that there's very little evidence of it's been it's been trumped up by by politicians in order to uh you know make some political hay um but there's just not real evidence of it and, and i've looked for it and I, i've tried to find it and, and it just doesn't exist um you know you can you can find onesie twosies here and there um so we really need to make sure that that citizens have the opportunity to vote and and efforts to to bring down the number of citizens that vote are a mistake. And, and I'll, uh, you know, certainly fight against those kind of that kind of legislation in the in the North Carolina House. Great. Thank you so much. Caleb Rudo. Yeah, great question. And a, a lot of agreement with my colleagues. Um, you know, I think. Uh, one, it, elections are secure. Our elections are secure. Um, I, I want to dispel any myths about that. Um, two, I think um, you know the General Assembly can can do a better job of continuing to fund you know the amazing work that our Board of Elections does ac across the state. Um, I, I think there are ways that we can make sure that um, you know those folks continue to have the financial support to to provide the excellent service they have for elections in the past. Um, and I think we can do better on, on making them accessible. Um, you know, I. I um, uh, one success story here is when I was in Zambia in the Peace Corps, I would vote by mail. Um, and it was an amazing program. I'd send in my absentee ballot from Zambia and the North, you know, Bunker of County Board of Elections would, would process it. And that was an amazing program. It made it easy for folks overseas to vote. And, and, I, and I think it speaks to the kind of dedication to, of the Buncombe County Board of Elections. Um, but I think we can do better. I think that means, you know, it, easier access to voting locations, you know, especially for, you know, lower income communities. You know, I think uh, the, the Access to the vote for felons is really amazing. You know, I'd like to see other ways that we could continue to make it easier for people to be automatically registered to vote. Um, I think the, you know, access to voting and registration when you get your driver's license is a great step. Um, but ultimately, you know, I believe our country and our state is is better off when we have more voices and when our voices are more representative. And I think any way that we can do that um, and and help bring more voices into the into the, the space is going to improve government. I think that's. That's our main priority. Fantastic. Holly Rose? Uh, yes. Well, um, we all want voter integrity. That's so crucial and foundational to our government system and our freedoms. Um, there is a problem with trust, though. 
uh, the last several elections, both parties, both Republicans and Democrats, have uh, uh, said that their their election was stolen. So this has been going on for a while uh, before Trump. And um, I think it, it's a problem when people doubt the integrity of the election, they may not participate. So I think we should do everything we can to ensure uh, voter integrity. Uh, the people of North Carolina voted for voter ID a while back that the majority of people wanted that. It is easy to get IDs. If it isn't, that's what we should address. Um, and we need to prevent fraud every way that we can so people have confidence in our elections. And I was horrified to learn that some low income uh, communities do uh, wait in very long lines to vote. That doesn't happen here in Buncombe County, really, uh, but it should never happen. And uh, we should use taxpayer funds to make sure that nobody is having to wait uh, for hours in the line to vote. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I believe the next question goes to Eric Ager first. A polling a few months ago and asked people in Western North Carolina a bunch of questions about politics and government. And um, one question was, I asked folks, do you think Western North Carolina receives enough attention from state government in Raleigh compared to other areas of the state? And only 11% of the people in Western North Carolina thought that we did get enough attention compared to the rest of the state. So if you are elected, what will you do to uh, address this gap and to one, get more attention to people in the Western part of the state and two, let them know that they are receiving that attention? Yeah, thanks, Chris. A really important question. And I, I mean, I, I think people are right, um, you know, th that what, whatever, 89% of the people don't think that Western North Carolina get gets enough uh, gets enough attention. And I think that's really true. And I, th I think it's a big problem in, in our mountains. I think there's a couple of ways to address it. Um, I, I think the first is that we really need to build a strong Western North Carolina caucus. And that means working across the aisle with with Republicans and, and, and figuring out, how, you know, what the things that we can agree on in order to bring things out here to Western North Carolina. And that's 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 funds and that's people. And that's and that's really making sure that our universities are great and that our hospitals are great. And I think those are all things that we can agree on. And I think in general, Raleigh just doesn't pay attention to. Um, and and it's it's probably not always their fault because there's a lot of issues around the rest of the state. But but it's really important that we we build a co coalition of folks from the West that can go to the legislature and, and, and make a difference. The, the second thing that I think we can do that I think would be helpful. And I think this is something we've struggled with um, in Appalach in the Appalachian region for a long time is that, you know, there's there's lots of pieces of a lot of states that make up the Appalachian region. Um, and so I would really like to reach out to uh, legislators in in uh, in Tennessee and Georgia and uh, you know Virginia and West Virginia and Kentucky um, in order to build a, a coalition of Appalachian legislators that can can then go back to their state capitals to help make a difference. Great, thank you so much, Caleb Rudow. Yeah, great question. You know, one of the things I always do when I when I drive to Raleigh is I try to stop in a separate, a different small town everywhere I, I go. You know, I take off a 40 for a bit and I take a little extra time because I want to see where other people live and, and really trying to get a better understanding of, you know, the state and 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 a perspective on other other representative towns and districts. And, you know, I wish other reps would do the same thing and would love to have people come here and see you know, more of what, what problems we have and really get to understand it, because I do think it's a huge problem. And, you know, I, I believe, you know, Eric's solution is, is a great one to start with. You know, I think Eastern Car North Carolina reps there have these big spending bills every cycle of what they all put together and they put their knees together um, and they can pass them because they have the voting power. And if we were work across the aisle in Western North Carolina, we could do the same to put together a, you know, a big spending bill that is you know, focusing on getting Western North Carolina a museum, which we, we should get that's on focused on broadband, that's focused on helping rural hospitals. And, and I really think um, if we work together, we can get that done, because I do think there are lots of challenges that we all face um, that are similar um, across Western North Carolina, and, and it would be in all of our best interests to put politics aside, you know, find ways that we can work together uh, and, and get those common wins. Thanks. Fantastic. 
Holly Rose? Well, I have to agree that the, it, what's crucial is working across the aisle, as you were saying. Um, the party politics, the division, uh, the not compromising, uh, this is so dysfunctional. And uh, if I get to go to Raleigh, I know how to work with people. And um, we've got to put the party politics aside and compromise. It, it all comes down to compromise and, you know, finding the middle ground to get things done. And I think that's been the problem is just the party politics. Um, we've got to get over that. And I think, I think that'll do a lot to bringing more resources to Western North Carolina. But another thing is just being a hardworking representative where uh, I will go and I will uh, sit in the right people's offices that have the purse strings and have the decision making uh, for the things that uh, Buncombe County needs. Lindsay Prather. Yeah, I think I think there are two main ways that we can address this issue. I mean, I I, I absolutely agree that um, that Raleigh does not include Western North Carolina in a lot of the necessary conversations, uh, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, uh, we need to improve connection uh, between Western North Carolina and other parts of the state in a lot of ways, right? Infrastructure, broadband, as Representative Rudow mentioned. Um, you know, it, I, I, there's a sense that Western North Carolina is kind of the, the playground, the vacation land uh, for, for the rest of the state. And so, you know, there are some issues that I think get attention uh, that have to do maybe with tourism um, and things like that uh, and, and other issues that don't get important attention. So aside from, from building that connection in, in you know, physical and, and, uh, and social ways, I think it's important that we build a deeper bench in Western North Carolina uh, when it comes to people who are involved in in politics uh, personally on my campaign team uh, it is staffed with people who are from western north carolina uh, people who have, have lived here have seen the issues and who want to stay here uh, and and give back to this region and that's really important you know of course we experience brain drain like a lot of rural areas do uh, and so having those opportunities for people to come back to this region have their jobs here build their skills here uh, is, is incredibly important. Um, so then those voices that are in Raleigh are genuine voices from, from Western North Carolina. Uh, we need, you know, the, the MPA program that I, that I went to at Western has a focus on specifically working in North Carolina and in rural areas. Uh, and I think that we need to look at, at funding and investing in more programs uh, that allow people to use their skills and knowledge here, not having to, to move other where, uh, in other places to, to get jobs and, and to give back to their state. Great, thanks. That's actually a nice segue to our next question, which I think I'll put first to Kayla Brudow and just keep the order going here. Um, teachers are leaving North Carolina in droves, or at the very least, they're leaving the teaching profession in North Carolina in droves. What can the General Assembly do to keep good teachers in the state and to keep good teachers in our classroom and make public education a first choice for today's college graduates? Such an important question. You know, I think, you know, first and foremost, you know, we need to give teachers more respect and we need to pay them more. And, and if, if we fulfilled those basic obligations, we could keep teachers. And, and, and that's something I hear from people all around the district. You know, the emails I get, you know, we don't pay our teachers enough. The, the emails I get from teachers that I had at Asheville High School who said, I've been here for years and I'm finally leaving because I, we're just, it, it's not financially feasible. And, and, I think the state should do whatever it can to pay those teachers correctly so we don't get in the way of the thing that they love to do. You know, folks don't go in there to, to make a ton of money, but they should be able to support themselves and live in Asheville and, and you know, and, and live on a teacher's salary, which unfortunately in lots of places in Asheville just isn't enough. And I voted no on the last budget because we had $6 billion sitting there that, you know, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle said, we're going to save for a rainy day. and you know, with the number of emails and the conversation I have with students and, and teachers on, on the need for more funding, I believe this is a rainy day right now. And, and we should be spending that money to help those folks. And, you know, I really think, you know, when we don't spend money on it now, 
we pay for it later because you know we don't have enough teachers in schools uh, because we don't have enough bus drivers. You don't, you know, these people are real heroes who have been working in the most difficult circumstances for the past two years. And it is shameful that we don't pay them the wages they deserve. We don't give them respect they deserve even after their heroic service. And you know, we'll stand up for that, have in the in general assembly and we'll continue to. Okay, Molly Rose. Yes, well, I've been listening to teachers recently trying to understand um, why so many are leaving the profession. And yeah, pay is a big part of it. Um, yeah, we we have to be competitive with our teacher pay. We can't we can't be so much lower uh, than other parts of the country, um, and it's just not right because it's a very difficult job and it takes a lot of training and it's it's a very challenging job and we want the best teachers. Um, I think we should pay teachers that do a good job. We should pay them more. Um, we need to find a way to let go of teachers that don't do a good job. And in my personal experience, that's part of the problem. Uh, the stress that teachers are facing right now is in addition to the pay, uh, students need more mental health support. There's a lot of mental health problems. Our kids are in mental health crisis really bad. And um, we are gonna have to address that and give more counseling, social work, mental health support to these kids and the school is the best place to do it. You can't expect a teacher to be a therapist and a disciplinarian and the educator and everything. And I've also heard from teachers that um, there's discipline problems. They used to get more support from administrators to keep order in the classroom and for some reason uh, that's also eroding. Um, we have to engage families and parents in the education process. I think we do a terrible job alienating uh, parents, making them feel like they have no say, they have no part, when really uh, that's what leads to student success is parent engagement. Great. Thank you. Lindsay Brather? Yeah. Um, two minutes is not enough time. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is an incredibly important topic. Um, I, in the last couple of months on the campaign trail, within two minutes of a conversation with somebody who's a teacher, uh, somebody is in tears. Um, our, our, our teachers and our school staff are struggling bad right now. Um, and, and we can help them in ways we can help them immediately, like raising teacher pay. Um, what that would do is it would also help to reduce class sizes. Uh, my twin sister was also a North Carolina teaching fellow. She's been teaching 12 years now uh, at a high school in North Raleigh. Um, she has a class of 36 ninth graders in her standard world history class. That's a safety issue, right? You wanna talk about school safety issues. That's a safety issue. We don't have enough teachers, um, then the classrooms are gonna get larger and larger and larger. Um, so that is absolutely something we have to do. We also need to look at our long-term solutions. Um, enrollment in our colleges and universities education teacher programs is plummeting. Uh, and that's a huge concern. What we're seeing people on the other side of the aisle do in response to that is try to water down the requirements that it takes to become a teacher. I think that's absolutely the opposite of what we need to be doing. We need to be investing in those programs. We need to be boosting training and resources and professional development so that teachers feel prepared uh, and so that they stay in the classroom. We also need to be investing in programs that encourage uh, people of color to go into the teaching profession. We have seen the resources and the data on uh, improvements for students of all races in the classroom uh, when they have teachers of color. Um, and so that's something that I know we need to be looking at, particularly in North Carolina, because our teaching staff does not reflect uh, our, our students in the state. Great. Eric Ager. Thanks. Uh, great answers from all from all the candidates here. Um, I mean, it's it's pretty simple in my mind. Uh, wages are rising across the board, and and schools need to compete. Um, the state needs to compete for the best and the brightest. Um, you know, teachers don't do this because they're, you know, they're looking to make a lot of money. They're not they're not trying to get wealthy. Um, they do it because they believe in it and they know that it's important. Um, we shouldn't take advantage of that and underpay them, which is what we've been doing for for too long here in North Carolina. Um, we need to 
get out there and recruit the best and the brightest and 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 get them into our schools so that they can you know we can continue to make this this state uh, an econo the economic engine that it needs to be um, and and really good schools is what drives good economics um, you know that's 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 not a new thing um, I was talking to my brother the other day and and he he said you know, wouldn't it be great that instead of, you know, if, if you're talking to some young young kid coming out of college and they told and they tell you they're going into teaching instead of saying, hey, that's that's very noble of you. You know, that's a great thing to do. We said, hey, that's great. It's it's you're going to be doing important work and you're going to have a great career. You're going to make money. You're going to have a great life. Um, that's what we need to be pushing for uh, for our teachers in North Carolina. Great. Well, thank you so much. And I can't believe it, but I believe we're actually getting close to time here for closing uh, statements. I just say, I, I wish we had more time. I've learned a lot um, just off the top of my head. You know, we didn't even get to talk about questions about economic development, about broadband, about inflation, about environment, uh, a host of issues that affect Western North Carolina, affect Buncombe County, and affect our state as a whole. So I encourage the folks listening, the folks watching, to some of those questions we didn't have a chance to ask today because um, there's a, a heck of a lot of important issues still to talk about. So with that said, we will move to three minute closing statements and I believe we'll be at Molly Rose to begin uh, the closing statement. Okay, thank you so much. Um, well, I, I didn't mention, uh, I do have a background where I've worked on environmental issues and while I, I believe that the free enterprise system is what creates prosperity for everybody, and we need to protect our resources, our natural resources in North Carolina, um, there's a lot of debate that needs to occur about how to protect the environment without destroying everybody's income and our economy. And uh, that has to be debated. You can't just pick a side and we're not gonna compromise. So that's important to me. Um, also, um, there's a great organization in Asheville called Building Bridges uh, that I participated in years ago. And it really opened my eyes to the prejudice and discrimination that my fellow citizens experience. And I believe America is always improving in this area and we will keep improving. Um, and I think we need to, we all need to recognize prejudice and it's many forms against many different kinds of people. Uh, but when we see prejudice and unfairness, we all need to speak up and do something about it. Um, you know, I value individual liberty so much and I fear that if we have too big a government with too high taxes, and too many rules and regulations, what it'll do is it'll stifle enterprise, stifle entrepreneurs, stifle creativity. There's a reason that China is trying to get after our technology. It's because American freedom is what has fostered uh, the advances in technology that we have seen. Um, so that is my concern that we support and defend our constitution and our constitutional republic system of government and i promise to do that thank you very much uh, we'll go to lindsey prather next yeah thank you and thank you again for having us um i think it's it's really important to provide these opportunities for voters to to hear from the people who are asking for their vote and their support uh and i want to thank everybody who is listening to this or who is watching uh, that is political participation, whether you realize it or not. Um, there are ways to participate in, in this process uh, that don't necessarily involve knocking on doors or being a campaign manager for somebody. Um, and, and I think that's really important moving forward, that, that more people are, are paying attention and are, are seeking out that, that information. Um, I am running for office because I want to do the work. Uh, I want to do everything I can to try to make North Carolinian lives just a little bit better. Uh, while, while I'm serving. I think it's really important that uh, we vote for candidates that have a history of, of public service, um, that we vote for candidates who are running for offices that they care about, um, for offices that 
they understand what the issues are that they can get done at that state level. Um, I think it's important that we vote for candidates who may not be experts in every issue, but who know how to tackle a problem um, and who know how to bring people together uh, to figure out who the stakeholders are and, and who needs to have a voice in the solutions. Uh, and that's the candidate that, that I am, and that's the legislator that I will be. Uh, I, as I said, uh, believe that representation is, is really important. Uh, and so I also want to encourage people, of course, vote for me and, uh, and support me. But in addition to that, I want you to think about the people in your life uh, that you think would be a good candidate. Uh, whether that's for state house or whether that's applying for most, you know, multimodal transportation board uh, with the county. Um, we need more voices. Uh, we have a problem in Raleigh with the same voices over and over. Uh, and so I want to encourage people to talk to the people in your life, your friends, um, your kids, teachers, uh, your the people that you know at church, uh, people that you think would, would make good representatives and, um, and talk to them about running for office and getting involved. Uh, because like I said, if, if we want to bring more voices um, to Raleigh from Western North Carolina, then, then we've got to start talking to people about that. So thank you so much. Great. And Eric Hager, next, please. Thanks. Well, first of all, I, I want to thank um, you, Chris, and, and Devine, and, and WPVM, and all the candidates here for, for putting this on. Um, and, and thank you to all the listeners that will be listening and are listening. Um, you know, to, to focusing in on this. I mean, this is exactly the kind of civil dialogue that we need to have um, uh, in order to, to make our democracy work. And, th and that's really what I'm focused on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm focused on going out there and, and making our democracy, uh, you know, solve, you know, help, helping our democracy solve real problems for real people. Um, you know, we had a great discussion here today. We talked about education. We talked about environment. We talked about teachers, we talked about Medicaid expansion and abortion access and, uh, and voting rights. And, and, and all of these things are important. The scope is huge. But as, as Chris mentioned at the beginning um, uh, of, of the, the broadcast here, it, it, you know, the state government and, the, and even the local government, the county and the city, um, you know, that's really where uh, dem democracy matters. It's really where decision making matters to people's everyday lives. Um, and, and so I, I really ask for your support, um, you know, to solve real problems for real people coming up uh, in the election in November. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Caleb Bruto. And again, thank, thanks, uh, Dr. Cooper and everyone else involved in, in, in getting this set up. It's really been a, a great discussion and I'm, I'm really grateful to be here along with the other candidates. Um, you know, I've been serving in the General Assembly since February to get things done for the people in the district. And, you know, when I knock on doors, you know, what I hear from most from people is not, are you Democrat or Republican? It's how can you help? And, and so I'm prioritizing, you know, putting people above politics and doing that. And what that has meant is, you know, we're really working on building relationships across the aisle um, in, in Raleigh. And, you know, and I really believe there's a lot we can get done together. And, you know, last uh, cycle in the short session, uh, I submitted you know, my first bills and I'm really proud of them. You know, we had a bipartisan bill to increase funding for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund um, with uh, Republican uh, John Hardister. Um, and, you know, we got that together because, you know, I went to his office and said, I know you care about affordable housing. I do. Let's get something done. And, and we put it forward. Uh, we, I put together a bill last cycle to increase money for early childhood education for the stabilization grants. I really believe that, you know, we need to help uh, folks pay for education. We need to help families. Um, and it helps both get people into work and, and mothers and, and fathers so they don't have to you know, do childcare and then go to their jobs, but it's also a good investment in our future. I put together bills last cycle to reduce waste, protect the environment um, that makes Western North Carolina such a special place to live. And you know, I believe there's a lot more work to be done to help folks. And that's, that's why I'm running in November. And I think that's you know, stuff we talked about like funding public education, by really focusing on affordable housing. And I think there are lots of ways we can get the public sector and the private sector to come together to, to, to make sure that everybody can afford a place to live. Um, I think that means expanding access to Medicaid. And you know, I, I'm glad we didn't get to talk about the environment, but I'm glad it was brought up because you know I grew up in these mountains. I'm, I paddled actually the whole French Broad River on my paddleboard last year. Um, and and I, I, love, I love these mountains and I, and I really believe that Protecting them is the right thing to do because they're a national treasure. 
that's the right thing to do economically. It's the right thing to do for our health. Um, and, and I think it just makes sense across the board. And I, I believe, you know, a lot of things we can do are, are bipartisan, but I also believe that, you know, we, we need to do those things without sacrificing our core values, like protecting the right for a person to make their own healthcare decisions about abortion, like protecting LGBTQ rights. Um, you know, I believe there, there's a lot we agree on, but I also believe it's important for our representative to stand in their values and stand in, in their core beliefs. And I'm honored to serve the district uh, and hope to continue serving um, after the election in November. Great. Thank you so much. I want to, um, of course, thank WPVM for having us today, for creating these kind of forums for civic dialogue. I want to thank the candidates for coming in, giving us your perspectives and giving them in a, a you know, in a reasonable and ration and, and kind way. So it, 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 I thought everybody did a great job making their perspective known whether where they agreed or where they disagreed. And that's what we need for democracy. I want to remind people there are three house districts in Buncombe County, 114, 115, and 116. It gets really confusing. So all you really need to remember is go to the Buncombe County Board of Elections website, go to the State Board of Elections website, they can help you out, type in your address, and you can figure out who's on the ballot and make sure that you're not one of the people who just votes the top of the ballot. We want to vote all the way down. And I really mean what I said at the outset. I think these are, in some ways, the most critical positions in our democracy. State politics are becoming more, not less important in our current environment. So it's not going to get as much attention as what's happening in Washington. Sometimes even what's happening locally. But this is the critical level of government in so many ways. Um, so thank everybody for being here today. We didn't have a chance to ask every question. So when you see these candidates, stop them, ask them questions, ask them polite questions, but ask them questions, follow up with the things that you're frustrated that we didn't get to ask today. Um, they are to be rewarded and congratulated for running for office. Um, but that does come with it some responsibility. And I know all are willing to take that. So when you see them, ask them questions that you want to know the answer to about how your state government can work better for you and for your communities. So with that said, I will sign off and thank everybody for being here.